good afternoon uh, today we are going to discuss about the export subsidies which are given to high technology sectors uh, and we are going to analyze through uh, game theory so these are this is a case where you have uh, two aircraft industries producing aircrafts airbus in europe is a european company and you have boeing which is from this is seattle based it's united states so there's a fierce competition between airbus and boeing because they are producers of the same aircraft now in this uh setting you you see a case where both airbus and boeing they are they are competing with each other and uh this uh, strategic interaction is evaluated through a simple game a game is defined as n s p the number of players the strategies which are available and the payoffs so the number of players here are two uh, boeing and airbus there are two players two strategies pr to produce that aircraft or not to produce and the payoffs are in terms of profits so if both airbus and boeing produce the same model say for example a380 both of them produce one emanating from europe the other coming from uh, us then the profits earned are minus 5 and minus 5 if boeing produces and airbus doesn't produce it's 100 and 0 so the first is the payoff for boeing the second one is the payoff for airbus and if boeing doesn't produce and airbus produces so it earns a profit of 100 airbus earns a profit of 100 boeing nothing and when both of them don't produce the same aircraft so nothing for them zero and zero now in this case uh, where you have all these payoffs you need to find out the nash equilibrium can you let me know what will be the nash equilibrium let me define nash equilibrium by unilaterally deviating from the nash equilibrium strategies underline all players should become worse off that's how you define nash equilibrium by unilaterally deviating from the nash equilibrium strategies all players should become worse off that's how you define nash equilibrium now in this case uh can you find out the nash equilibrium for this game so you can see that this game has multiple equilibria it has two nash equilibrium can you locate which which are the two nash equilibrium so produce boeing produces airbus doesn't produce 100 and 0 why because remember nash equilibrium is that by unilaterally deviating all players underlined all players should wo become worse off so if airbus keeps playing its nash equilibrium strategy not produce and boeing moves from produce to not produce it would lose 100 to 0 okay this is first player second player boeing keeps playing its nash equilibrium strategy and airbus uh, this player moves from not produce to produce so it moves from 0 to minus 5 so both players by unilaterally deviating from the nash equilibrium strategy lose so this is one nash equilibrium so when you say nash equilibrium p n p is the nash equilibrium and n p p again this is the nash equilibrium because if airbus keeps playing this strategy and boeing moves from not produce to produce it loses 
and if Boeing keeps playing this strategy, Airbus moves from produce to not produce, it loses because it gets zero. So, you have two Nash's equilibrium that is Boeing and Airbus, uh, either one of them producing, the other one not producing. Now, now it is a matter of chance or probably technology, who comes first in the market? If say Airbus comes first in the market, then it will produce the aircraft and Boeing will not. Now see what happens if you bring in this component of subsidies which are given to uh, say Airbus. Now, uh, you, you, if you read the literature, there, there is a whole lot of examples of how governments in Europe have supported this industry. It is like Kingfisher, who, which is in red, and now the Indian government tries to support it by giving loans or um, by giving salaries to its staff. If you read the history th throughout, you will see numerous cases where the European governments have supported uh, this industry, say Airbus, and in United States in another form. Uh, of support here basically in terms of R and D loans, here Boeing in terms of uh, the infrastructure and markets and so on. So, so we, we, um, so we bring in the export subsidy component and it is the Europeans who decide to give the money to the Airbus of the tune of 25. So, uh, so it is not just 25, it is 25 million euros or something like that. So, then uh, look at the new payoffs, 25 is given, so uh, Airbus payoffs changes from minus 5, so it, this becomes 20 because 25 minus 5, 20 not produce 0, profits increase to 125. This is the same. Now, uh, try to evaluate this game, wherein the subsidies are given to Airbus. So, look at uh, Airbus producing and Boeing not producing. Look at this, this particular strategy. If Boeing moves from not produce to produce, it loses. If Airbus moves from produce to not produce, it loses. So, produce this becomes your Nash equilibrium. Here you had two Nash's equilibrium, here you have one Nash equilibrium. So, that is what support can give. Support can do it. If you give the subsidies, you would see that in the market, you would have an entirely different scenario, where now the now, the Airbus would produce and uh, the Boeing will be out of the market. So, that is what subsidies can do. So, as I said, whatever subsidies you give, agricultural subsidies, whatever form, it tends to distort the markets. So, that is what uh, is the position of India that whatever subsidies are given, they distort the market. But in the WTO, they they have they have only talked of dismantling the export subsidies, not about the other forms of subsidies. There is domestic farm support and many other forms of subsidy, R and D support and things like that. As I said, yes, they they define subsidies in terms of the colors: red light subsidies, yellow light subsidies, blue light subsidies. Red light subsidies are you know, countries are not allowed to impose them impose them. Yellow light subsidies are like countervailing duties, where you can impose, um, where, where you can give subsidies, provided you, you, you prove that the foreign country has been given subsidies, has been giving subsidies. So, then you can impose countervailing duties. And then there are blue, li blue line subsidies. So, this is what it can, uh, what it does it distorts the market. Now, in this case, 
you can see that uh, the profits are 125 so european the european the, the europe as an asian uh, earns 125 as profits the subsidies given is 25 so the net result is a gain of 100 million euros for the european nations so this is what subsidies can do now let's discuss another case where boeing has a cost advantage now then we'll see what happens if export subsidies are given by airbus so the second case will be a case where one industry has some cost advantage it has a comparative advantage of producing things and see how it will distort the market once the subsidies are given by the europeans so uh, let's uh, discuss another game so here boeing has a cost advantage Now look at this particular game, Boeing has a cost advantage, these are the payoffs, 5 and minus 5, 125 and 0, 0, 100, 0, 0. Can you identify the Nash equilibrium of this game? Right, so look at this look at this uh, if Boeing unilaterally moves from P to NP it loses if Boeing keeps playing its Nash equilibrium strategy Airbus moves from NP to P it loses so this is the Nash equilibrium when I say this it means the strategies P and NP P and NP are the Nash equilibrium strategies so, Boeing had a cost advantage, for example, if uh, due to various reasons uh, it could produce the big aircraft A380. Uh, now, see what happens if export subsidies, if Europeans decide to give subsidy to Airbus of the tune of 25. So, 5 and 20 0 and 125 125 and 0 and 0 and 0 now which one uh, because it's having a cost advantage of plus 10. 
No, uh, say minus 5 and 25, 20, it produces. Can you identify the Nash equilibrium of this game? Please see what happens here. Here, Boeing had a cost advantage. And as soon as the subsidies are given to the Airbus, now the Nash equilibrium becomes P and P. That means do both now are able to produce the aircraft. This becomes the Nash equilibrium. But in this case, it comes with a cost because the profits are 20 and the Europeans give 25 as subsidies. So there is a loss of minus 5. So apart from distorting the markets, where earlier Boeing had a cost advantage, the Europeans lose, lose, uh, lose the amount because the profits are 20 and the subsidy is given at 25. So what I am trying to say is that whenever these subsidies are given, uh, it tends to distort the markets, okay, like in the case of agricultural subsidies. Okay, so this is about the subsidies. Let me uh, come back to the case of tariffs and finish up certain things which were left.
okay this again the same set of things that we did uh, last few days <coughs> the net welfare for the home country e minus b plus d the net welfare for foreign e minus c e minus f net welfare for the world minus b minus d minus f so if you put it in in this uh, if you wish to analyze this through game theory so again a game is defined by n s p number of players strategies and payoffs two players country a country b who are trading with each other strategies two strategies whether to impose tariffs or not to impose tariffs two payoffs payoffs 0 and 0 if no tariffs are imposed but if country b imposes tariffs and if it's an optimum tariff then the net welfare that it gets is e minus b plus d e is the terms of trade gain these are the distortions in the economy and for optimum tariff this is greater than 0 and for us if the foreigners impose tariffs we are the losers because tariffs are beggar thy neighbor policies you benefit at the cost of others if they impose tariffs we lose of the tune of minus e minus f reason being that if you impose tariffs then i have to lower my prices to enter your markets that's where i lose so it's of the tune of minus e minus f this is the terms of trade gain for the foreigners this is the terms of trade loss but there is something else which is minus f these are distortions which happen if tariffs are imposed if you impose tariffs then you gain e minus b plus d which is greater than 0 for optimum tariffs the other loses your partner loses and if both impose tariffs you end up with the net welfare of minus b minus d minus f which is minus d minus minus b minus d minus f minus d minus d minus f identify the nash equilibrium of this game remember nash equilibrium by unilaterally deviating all players should become worse off so both of them impose tariffs t t and t is the nash equilibrium so the ideal situation would have been this when no country would have imposed tariffs but then the dominant strategy is playing t because if if this is this then there is always a, a profitable opportunity for the other for the country to deviate from this strategy and gain because remember when you impose tariffs there is a terms of trade gain there are distortions but then for 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 some tariff there will be an increase in net welfare so if both of them are thinking in the same way they end up imposing tariffs as a result the world welfare goes down so that's the reason that you need an intervention of a foreign body such that all countries come under a same banner and discuss how do we resolve the question of imposing tariffs so that's the reason that gat came into being the wto came into being there is an external body wherein you can discuss how and uh, how you can um, reduce tariffs or not impose tariffs so this also gives a backing of why you need an external body when um, you have two countries imposing tariffs okay another quick point on tariffs now i talked about tariffs which are imposed for various reasons if you recall tariffs are imposed because you can get necessary revenue because as soon as the products cross the customs boundary you can impose customs duty so one is tariff revenue 
Second, you impose tariffs because uh, you want to promote the import competing sector, you want to promote certain industries in, in your country. For example, in India or in Brazil, they wanted to promote hardware industry right in the 60s. So, the tariffs which were imposed on computer hardware was as high as 300 to 400 percent in the six in, in the 60s and the 70s. That is another thing that that was the time when we wanted everything to be produced under public sector. So, the efficiency went down. So, you are protecting an industry, there has to be a domestic industry which can produce that product efficiently, right. You are you are you are not allowing competition to come from outside, but then you need to be efficient. What Japanese did was, they did a smart thing. They also were similar like India, Koreans were similar like India, they had very high tariffs. Still Japan, Japan uh, for most of the products have very high industrial tariffs and agricultural tariffs are still higher. But what they do is that they have enough of competition within their uh, market within their country, so that the products that come out or churned out are efficiently produced. We, what we did from 50s till 90s were, we had very high tariff, tariff rates. So, we could deter competition from outside, but we could not produce goods efficiently within India. So, we became complacent about the fact that we are not allowing competition, we did not have, we did not have enough of competition within, in, within India. So, the Japanese model and the Indian model differs in that way, but Japanese were also the ones which had very high tariff rates. So, there are various reasons of why you impose tariffs, you do not want competition, you want to promote your own industry, you want to get easy money because you can impose customs duties and get the revenue. Another argument which is, which was given was an infant industry argument, that you impose tariffs to protect industries which are at infancy, they are just coming up. It is like a baby, uh, you protect the baby till he grows, till he is grounded, he becomes mature, he can work and he can earn. So, the argument is that you give tariffs, you impose tariffs because you want to protect your infant industries. So, in the 50s, the thought, the, the thought uh, which was prevailing at that time is that we need to protect our heavy industries. These are new industries which are coming up. So, uh, uh, we need to impose tariffs. That is another reason that uh, why India had very high tariff rates on industrial products. Now, if you wish to analyze this through analytically, you can, you can think of a case where you have a monopolist working, right, a single producer, think of someone who decided in the 50s that I will set up a plant. So, he is the single monopolist, but the competition is coming from outside. So, you are a, you are a small country, you are a small country, you are a small country. You are a small country, but then there is a, uh, 
you are a monopolist, you are the only one who is producing this product, right? single producer of that product, but then the average cost that you face is this. And because it is it's a small country, so the export supply curve that it faces is perfectly horizontal and, and this is the price which prevails in this market. And if you recall, the monopolist cannot charge its monopoly price, reason being that he has to act like a perfect competitive producer. Why? Remember, if it is a monopolist, he faces this demand curve, this is the marginal revenue curve, this is the MC curve, the price that he would charge will be this. But the price which prevails in this market is PW. He cannot charge P star, reason being that if he charges P star, the consumers will undercut him, will not buy from him, they will buy it from outside because there are large number of producers which are producing that same homogeneous product and they are ready to supply it to the Indian market. And then the situation is such that uh, uh, the average cost that you face is like this. So, the average cost is this, this is or the average revenue or the marginal revenue curve. If no support comes from anywhere, this monopolist will have to close down its business. Okay. So, the difference between the analysis that we were doing earlier is that now I am bringing this infant industry argument that here is an industry which has, which wants to start its business. Yeah. He is a monopolist. The average cost that he faces is this and the average revenue is this. So, unless and until something happens or the government support comes, he will not be able to sustain his business. So, how will the support come? The support will come if the government imposes tariffs. So, if the government imposes tariffs, you know what happens. The domestic price of that good goes up. So, the hope, the hope, the hope for this small producer is that when countries will impose tariffs, uh, when, when this country will impose tariffs, the domestic price would go up. So, P w plus P would reach here. So, if it reaches here, this is the average revenue curve, this is the average cost curve, right. So, at least he can sustain his business or if the tariffs are imposed, it can go till here, where the average revenue is greater than average cost. So, this is in a way supporting this, uh, this particular industry. Of course, the net welfare for a small country will work out to be minus B minus T. And you know what the hope is? The hope is that this, uh, you protect the industry, because you are hoping that he would, he would learn over time. So, it is like learning by doing. So, you give support to this industry that we are supporting you. You produce, but you learn by doing. We will give all sort of support to you, scientific support, technological support, infrastructural support. We will support you for say certain years till you grow up, till you mature and then uh, you can sustain your own self. Now, that is reflected, that will be reflected by the downward shift of the average cost curve. So, that is the infant industry argument. It is also 
what the Erovian concept of learning by doing, that over time you produce. So, the future is, the future is that this average cost will come down, because we have given support now and in future this average cost will come down. So, then, so then the producer surplus that you would have will be E and this E is supposed to be greater than this these distortions which are created uh, initially. So, the future is that this average cost will come down, this will be the producer surplus, this would be greater than minus b minus c. Now, this you are doing because you want to support it. Maybe that industry does not have enough of resources to, to sustain its business, maybe it is not able to borrow from the banks because it is small, nobody knows about the business that he is doing. Second uh, reason uh, of market failures can be that he does not have a patent to, uh, to uh, for, for the research that it is doing. For these two reasons, for the market failures, the government steps in to impose the tariffs. So, in a way it supports that industry, hoping that after some time it will sustain itself, it will be grounded, it will have that maturity and this average cost will come down, so that it will have a producer surplus which is greater than the distortions which are created in the economy. So, that is another reason why countries impose tariffs. India also did it, Brazil also did it for supporting its computer industry. Uh, the US did it um, for saving its motorbike industry, especially the Harley Davidson bikes, because it started facing competition from the Japanese producers. So, in the 80s, if you see the history, there was, there was a very, uh, there, was, there was a concerted move by the Reagan government to save the Harley Davidson um, motorbikes by imposing tariffs. So, we will talk about those cases, but this tells you about why, another reason why you impose tariffs, besides revenue, besides deterring competition, increasing production of the import competing goods. Another, another reason why countries impose, impose tariffs. So, I will end up here. Um, tomorrow, we are going to discuss a case where you would have a foreign monopolist who is providing the product. We, till now, we have been discussing home monopolist facing competition from outside. Now, we will discuss what happens if a foreign monopolist is providing product to the Indian market. And then, we will come back to the dumping case. And then, finally, we will move to that um, uh, how to evaluate the regional trade. Um, regional trade organizations. Once we finish this, then we will finish up the trade policy part and then we move to the trade theory part, that is the most dif uh, 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 difficult component, because there you will have lot of equations, you will discuss about different trade theories, Ricardian, Hicksherolian, the Krugmans and the new, new trade theories. So, we will see how much we can cover up in this course. Right? Okay. Thank you.